Hello and welcome to our second lab on conservation of energy. Now you might recall in our first lab we looked at the energy of a cart rolling down a track. And as the cart rolled down the track there was a decrease in potential energy. However, because the cart's velocity was increasing, there was a corresponding increase in kinetic energy. Now the total mechanical energy, which is the sum of those two, stayed about the same. However, we saw that when we increase the force of friction, which is a non-conservative force, there was a change in mechanical energy due to the work done by that non-conservative force. So in a similar sense, we're going to look at the energy of a dropped ball. And so if you can imagine a position versus time graph, sort of a height versus time graph of a dropped ball, it would look sort of like this. It starts at some height, and as it falls, it gets faster and faster, and you've got this parabolic um, shape here determined by the um, our kinematic equations showing the position of the ball over time. So imagine our time axis going this way. Well, if we were to plot the potential energy of the ball to look at the change in potential energy, it would look just like this. It would have the same shape because potential energy is mgh where m and g are constants and so this would just be, it would just look just like h versus time, or position versus time, scaled by a factor of mg. So here's our potential energy. Now as the ball begins to fall, it picks up speed. So it starts off with a low velocity, and our velocity versus time will be a linear graph with increasing velocity. And so, but however, we want to plot our kinetic energy. And kinetic energy goes with velocity squared. It's one-half mv squared. And so, probably not surprisingly, because there's no non-conservative forces at work except for a small amount of air resistance, the change in kinetic energy is going to look just like the opposite of the change in potential energy. Very much like this. And so our total mechanical energy, which is the sum of these two, is going to be a horizontal line showing no change. Actually, let me show a slight change, a slight downhill to this line. It will be, there will be a small change in the mechanical energy. It's going to decrease a little bit, and that's because of the non-conservative force of air resistance as the ball falls through the air. But now something happens that I want to look at when the ball hits the ground. Something very strange. You see, as the ball hits the ground, well, we have a change in potential. Let me add to that a change in kinetic, delta Ke. And that is equal to our sum of those two, which is a change, delta Me, change in mechanical energy. Now, as the ball hits the ground, it's going to come to a stop, bounce, and it's going to go through some bounce that looks sort of like this. Then it's going to bounce again. Now you've noticed how I've drawn this, the ball doesn't bounce as high on the second time as, it, as you dropped it from. And on the third bounce, it doesn't go as high as the second bounce. So somewhere along the way we're losing energy just by observing that the ball does not bounce as high. Now, where does that mostly happen? Well, you see, you see that in the air, the ball is not losing a lot of energy because its mechanical energy stays about the same. Now something kind of strange happens with the um, kinetic energy because you see this ball comes to a stop that means its kinetic energy goes to zero. So it had reached some maximum right before you hit the ground and very quickly the kinetic energy drops to zero. But then as the ball bounces back up the kinetic energy again pops up to some maximum value but we'll notice that the maximum value is not as high as it was before. And then it makes the shape sort of like this. So as the ball's height gets higher and higher, the kinetic energy drops. And to this point, the ball is at the top of its path, and it stops again and goes back down. Kinetic energy goes to zero, then back up. Again, the ball hits the ground. And then pops back into the air, and our cycle compete, completes. Our cycle repeats. So. How does our mechanical energy look during this time? Well, our mechanical energy 
because potential and kinetic are zero, it also goes to zero. Gets back and becomes the sum of the two. Goes to zero at the next bounce and comes back and it's the sum of the uh, two. So what I want to do is look at what's going on in between here during the bounces. And as it turns out, there's a third energy in there as well. And this is the spring energy of the elastic ball. As the ball hits the ground, it compresses. And so its kinetic energy that it had here is converted very quickly into spring energy, all right, elastic energy. And so as it does that, this is not something we're observing through watching the motion of the ball. But our mechanical energy is not really going to zero. However, it is decreasing. And so we get this step down in, kinet in mechanical energy that's due to the fact that energy is lost during this interaction with the ball on the ground. So as the ball strikes the ground, the energy um, is lost due to the um, sound, due to the friction between the ball and the ground. And the same thing happens over here on the second bounce. Energy decreases. So our mechanical energy really is doing this sort of a step down. And the reason it looks like it goes to zero because kinetic and potential are going to zero is because we're not taking into consideration the elastic potential energy of that bouncing ball. So in this lab, you're going to use the motion sensor to watch the height of a drop ball, uh, convert that to potential energy, gravitational potential, and then, you know, with the motion sensor, you can also not only get the height, but the velocity. So you can also, from that, figure out the uh, kinetic energy, plot those against each other, sum them up, and you should be able to get a third plot called total mechanical energy, and you can sort of observe whether it follows that step-down pattern. Um, this is how we'll do it. Here's your motion sensor. Here is the elastic ball. And probably the easiest way is to just set the motion sensor over the edge of the table and hold the ball underneath it. It needs to be at least 15 centimeters from the motion sensor because there's a certain amount of time that it takes the sound to bounce back and it has to be far enough away that the sound doesn't bounce back before the motion sensor converts itself from a, from a speaker to a microphone to receive that signal. That happens a little past the 15 centimeter mark. So starting 15 centimeters below the sensor, we can now drop this ball and observe the bouncing motions. So, as you saw from the dropping ball, each bounce was lower than the bounce before it. So obviously we're getting some kind of decrease in the total mechanical energy due to that collision between the ball and the ground. So during that collision, energy is lost and we'll examine it using Logger Pro. So, sort of to sum up, we've noticed that mechanical energy, the change in mechanical energy is equal to a change in potential plus a change in kinetic. And of course, we also know how this third term plus a change in um, elastic potential energy, we'll call that EPE, those three things sum up to the change in mechanical energy. If the change in mechanical energy is not zero, then we know that that's due to the fact that there was work done by a non-conservative force. So a change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by a non-conservative force. Now, in the last part of the lab, we're going to be looking at power. Power is sort of defined as the uh, rate of change of energy. So as uh, you do work on an object, work, if you look at the um, change in work over time, that's going to be equal to the power. So power measured in watts is equal to a joule of work per second, the unit of time. So a joule per second is a watt of power. Now, as it turns out, when you do work, it only counts if you're doing work in the direction of the motion. And so we have a very obvious situation where if we lift, jump into the air, we're doing work in the exact direction of the motion, we can calculate uh, how much power we're using. So to do that, we're going to um, not really jump into the air, but we're going to run up a flight of steps. 
and each step has a certain height, and you can calculate how high you go, total height upward, pushing against the gravitational force. And we can also use a stopwatch, uh, you probably have one on your cell phone, to measure how much time it takes for you to, to uh, change your height. So by changing your height, you've done a work that's equal to your gained p potential energy. So your MGH is the work you've done because it's caused you to have a change in potential energy. And you know the time, so therefore you can calculate the power in watts. You're going to convert that to horsepower, which is sort of describes um, the amount of power that's done by uh, these mine ponies in the 1800s that pulled ore out of mines using a pulley system. And so you'll convert that to horsepower and see how much horsepower you have when you run up a flight of steps.